Hiring people. Hi, everybody. The future is weird. <laughs> Mobile popped over this wireless battery bank for an unboxing. Let's awesome. Shall I begin? Let's see, we have 27 people attending. Uh, looks like we're live on YouTube and recording. Okay, I think I'm gonna get started and uh, folks can catch up. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, this is a very special Maker Fair. <laughs> I've been to many in my time and this is probably the weirdest so far. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I wanna to talk today about um, the, the effort that has uh, become open source medical supplies um, how it got started, what it is now. Um, so yeah, I'd like to go ahead and jump in. Let's see. So before I dive in, can somebody confirm that they can in fact see my screen and that I am sharing a presentation? Uh, so yes, I, I could see it. This is Dale. <laughs> Hi, Dale. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in, unless, uh, Dale, you want to say something up front? No, just jump in. Great, Great to have you. Well, thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, so welcome, everybody, uh, to Making a Global Movement, uh, the story of open source medical supplies. Uh, so I want to talk about, you know, the, the craziness that is uh, this pandemic. I want to talk about the story of the pandemic, and I want to talk specifically about everybody who stepped up to respond to it and all of the ways in which you all did so. Um, the, the big issue here is that everything about how this pandemic has, has played out has been in response to how it started, which is quite simply that uh, when the pandemic started in China, uh, China responded by locking down 780 million people in response. Right. And this was, you know, it's still considered one of the best responses uh, to the actual medical issue. But uh, when Wuhan locked down, all of the factories in China in that part of the country also closed. Right. And so you started seeing this massive cutoff of any sort of supply uh, from that part of the world. And the issue for us in the US and globally is that all of our supply chains are set up to be just in time, right? And this has been one of the big like success stories of the modern manufacturing era is that we managed to create this like centralized manufacturing system that supplied things all over the globe, but just in time for when they're needed, which means that nobody had inventory, nobody had, you know, surplus supplies and within even just a week of China's factories shutting down, we already had supply shortages across the US. And just to talk about how big of a deal this is, you know, Health and Human Services had to come out and basically say, notice on March 4th, right, before anything happened in the US, on March 4th, HHS was saying, hey, we're gonna need 3.5 billion N95s if this pandemic comes to the US, right? And that's a, that's a really big number. Those are medical grade masks that keep healthcare workers protected, that keep citizens protected. But the issue is that local manufacturing, let's say 3M, can only make 100 million N95 a month. So we're already at the point where, hey, we need 3.5 billion. We can only make you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the masks we are supposed to use uh, to combat this type of pandemic. That's the issue, right? It's that manufacturing stopped. It's that centralized manufacturing is in fact extremely fragile when it comes to this sort of thing. And it takes a long time to build back up. And so you, you see this issue where, hey, you know, 
centralized manufacturing hubs that are filled with thousands of people on the job are actually outbreak locations, right? The places where you're trying to make things turn into outbreak hotspots. The logistics chain that you rely on, the ports, the aircraft, right? Those are outbreak hotspots, right? We have 100,000 sailors stuck at sea on container ships because they're not allowed to disembark, right? Because they are, again, on ships that are outbreak hotspots. Um, we have air travel down 85%, and it turns out that air cargo capacity dropped by 60% across the globe because air cargo is carried on commercial airliners, right? Like, we've, we've made this beautiful global system for moving things around, and then it all broke at the same time because of this pandemic. Um, we even had this issue where all, Wuhan was shipping all of these things from China, uh, right as it shut down, refused all imports, and then we sent containers one way across the ocean. So we had the port of LA, the port of Oakland, ports on the West Coast jammed with literal empty containers because international sea shipments were paused, right? And that's a huge, huge, like indescribably huge issue. It takes 30 days for an empty container to go back to China to get filled and come back here, right? So issues all around. Um, and these centralized large manufacturing systems take a long time to spool up and down. Um, so on top of that, there's just this idea of like, how does this system even work in the first place? It turns out for a lot of very good reasons, um, it's really, really slow to share new medical discoveries and scientific information, uh, especially around novel diseases that aren't fully understood. It can take months to years just to approve and disseminate a scientific paper. Right? Medical practitioners on that same token often aren't allowed to speak publicly on social media or on behalf of their hospital systems or what have you. So you end up with this silence from people who are in a lot of trouble. Right, You have medical device approval being a slow process through the FDA where it can take you know, up to 10 years to approve a new medical device through the FDA's usual you know, uh, procedures. And the manufacturing supply chains for those medical devices can take months to years to spool up, to increase production, to create a new factory, right? And then the underlying subtext of all of this is that COVID-19 doubles every three to four days when it's unchecked, right? So we have this fundamental disconnect between how things get made in the world traditionally and how a pandemic spreads and takes out our logistical infrastructure that is used to supply these things, right? And so the question is, what can we do, right? This is a horrific issue. Uh, there are a lot of mismatches that are really scary. Like what can we do as citizens to help fight this thing? Um, and my answer, and the answer of a lot of people around the world is, well, we need to make things locally and we need to make them everywhere, right? So what does that look like? Well. I think it looks like gathering, sharing, amplifying accurate information from a centralized source. One of the only things I think should be centralized is the curation of accurate information. Um, I think this issue is bigger than any one person or any one group can possibly address. It affects literally everyone on earth. So there is no option for one big organization to actually do all the work, right? Even for an entire country. Right? We must build coalitions everywhere extremely quickly. Uh, we have to stay in tune the entire time with what local communities and people are telling us and adjust our plans accordingly. We still don't understand this disease. We still don't have a full understanding. And it's been six months since the first case was diagnosed. Right? It is a novel disease. It is the first of its kind. We are still learning constantly about how it's transmitted, in what environments it's transmitted, right? What can be done to prevent a spread? And so we actually have no choice but to continue to redefine what we are doing based on the information that we're getting. And we have to redefine how we are supplying things based on the information available to us on the ground. Um, at the same time, it's not actually enough to be reactive, 
right? This is a long process. It is a long pandemic. It will be with us for a long time. And if we are just being reactive, and if we are just like acting out of impulse, we will burn ourselves out and stop being able to work on this, right? And so while we have to be reactive and fast moving, we actually have to formalize structures and efforts to survive the long haul, which is this kind of horrifying amount of energy that we all have to expend to do so. But it's the only way to keep going throughout this entire thing. And then at the end of the day, we have to help people help themselves, right? There, again, is no one source that can supply everything we can possibly need to fight this pandemic. We must actually help ourselves. We must have the courage to help our local communities. And that's the only way this gets done. Um, so at the end of the day, after all of this, we have to do something. We have to make things, we have to not wait. Because if we wait, it's too late, right? That is the issue with an exponentially growing thing. You have a little bit of time very early on to set patterns into place that can help. And then you don't have that time anymore. So where does this all go? This turned into an effort called open source medical supplies. Um, this is what we look like right now. As this is our most public face. This is our public Facebook group called Open Source COVID-19 Medical Supplies with 73,800 members all across the world. What this group has done, what the open source movement has done over the past eight weeks is mind boggling. 8.7 million units of open source medical supply items that had never been designed before were shipped internationally. They were shipped everywhere. We're now up to 51 countries being tracked. Um, this is the low end of our estimate of the things that are being made, but these are medical supplies that are necessary in all of the world's hospitals, all of the world's communities to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to help people respond to it. Um, and these supplies range the gamut. So what's happening here is we are seeing this groundswell of makers all over the world who are stepping up and who are taking care of their local communities um, where this pandemic is hitting the hardest. So very, very briefly, who am I? Why am I speaking to you? What is going on? Um, my name is Guy Cavalcanti. Usually I build robots. Um, turns out robots are a lot like systems um, and like the systems that fail uh, in this kind of pandemic. So I was already in a mindset uh, around, hey, what's going on? All of these systems need to work together. This doesn't work anymore. Usually I like building robots. Usually they're big and weird and cool. Um, usually I like going to regular maker fairs and uh, you know doing things like shooting cannonballs in front of small children and making big messes and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, before that, uh, me and a whole bunch of other folks started a uh, makerspace in Somerville, Massachusetts called Artisans of Asylum, um, which is a 40,000 square foot, incredibly hard to describe crazy space uh, with woodworking shops, machine shops, metal shops, uh, welding areas, fabric areas, you name it. It's all of the crafts we could possibly stuff into one place under one roof. Um, and as a part of that, uh, we decided we wanted to get people to make their own maker spaces because this is really cool. So here's a shot of me and Dale quite a while ago um, and, uh, and Matt Orline from Detroit at the time uh, talking to people about how to make their own maker spaces. Uh, so again, with that theme of, hey, we got to help people help themselves set these things up. But honestly, I am just the organizer of an incredible, huge team that is actually doing the work. Um, this is roughly what it looks like with a couple of exceptions. Um, so me and uh, my co-executive director, Molly Rubenstein, are the chief cat herders of open source medical supplies. And over the past 10 weeks, we have built up this team of full-time, incredible full-time staff plus dedicated volunteers um, that range the gamut from a documentation team that is responsible for maintaining and curating our, our medical supply guide, a medical team that's helping us like understand and bridge the gap between the medical community and the maker community, a communications team that helps us get the word out 
in ways that actually reach people because it turns out that's really hard uh, to do in modern society. A community team that moderates the incredible group of cats that we've assembled, uh, local response team helping us set up individual efforts um, to be self-sustaining, and then a technology team that helps us create the tools necessary to make this a long-term endeavor. And then that whole full-time group uh, helps coordinate around 800 dedicated volunteers around the world and local organizers and so on. That's connected to 74,000 makers that are in the Facebook group um, who are on the ground doing the work, making supplies and distributing them to their local communities. And that's probably a low end of the estimate. People aren't necessarily all in the group who are doing the work around the world. And it may seem like this suggests that the executive disseminates ideas down and then they happen. And that is not at all how this works. Uh, we have constant convoluted chains of communication and cycles between, you know, makers who are inventing things, telling us, you know, hey, we have this medical supply. Is this good? Is this worth um, investigating? We have a medical team who's like checking with hospitals and the FDA and the NIH about like, hey, is this a worthwhile device? Uh, we have a documentation team rapidly ingesting those ideas and turning them into this high quality source of information repository. We have community managers telling everybody what's happening around the world. We have a communications team speaking directly to makers and hearing back, right? This is, this is not a top-down organization. This is just a, a loose structure of very competent cats that are attempting to all herd in one direction. Um, what's our mission? It's pretty simple. We're trying to create a platform for information sharing and curation and amplification, right? There is some information that just needs to be high quality and centralized. And we need to be able to present, present that in a way that can be translated into all languages across the earth so that people can make these things, these medical supplies they need to fight the pandemic. Um, we need to also capture best practices for how local communities can support themselves. We learned very early on that it's not actually enough to provide the information alone, right? You actually need to provide guidance around how to structure your group, right? Because people don't necessarily know how to self-organize. They don't know how to make like nonprofit organizations. They don't know how to make community response efforts. They don't know how to make mutual aid organizations in the first place. You have to help, right? You have to, to help create that. Um, and that's something that we've taken on under the understanding that it's just, it's not enough to tell people the things that could be made, right? So after that, you know, we're trying to help build these resilient local networks, right? We're trying to build networks of trust between makers and their communities um, where their communities know they can come to their makers if they need something quickly, right? And we want makers to know who all in their communities need help in the first place, because those makers might not know. Um, we also want to create a resilient ne network of information sharing so that if anything like this happens again, which it very well may, we are ready and we don't have to invent the wheel from scratch all over again every single time. So we want to capture all of the effort that's going into this. And we want to, you know, make this worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> I will take question and answers at the end. I just noticed there was one, um, but I'll, let's, let's come back to that. Um, the key rule for open source medical supplies and the Slack channel we created, which I'll talk about in a second, is we have absolutely restricted any designing or engineering of any medical supplies on Slack or within OSS. And this is one fundamental difference we have from literally everybody work, working on this problem where my initial instinct was, hey, I should design and engineer the thing that saves the day until I realized the scope of the problem was gigantic and no one group could design or engineer the thing necessary to save the day. There are so many components of the problem. And so our rule from the beginning has been 
We are here to amplify. We are here to curate. We are here to find the information being generated by other people that doesn't have amplification all over the world. And we are going to put it in one spot and make it easy to access. Um, and that has been the narrowing of our scope that is absolutely necessary for us getting this done. Um, so just quickly, you want to go through the history here so everybody knows we can get to what's coming next. So I'm, I'm making this in days because I want people to understand. Um, 75 days ago, the Facebook group was created. And the original Facebook group was to create a ventilator. That was the original goal on March 10th was I was reading a bunch of things out of Italy about how ventilators were in short supply. I freaked out. I said, hey, we're gonna need uh, we're gonna need those ventilators here. We don't have enough. And so the very first thing that was published was a requirements document for ventilators. The requirements document from an engineering perspective is a device that or is is a is a document that catalogs the how, why, you know, uh, where and when of like what you are designing as a product to come up with a thing, right? You can't design a ventilator without knowing all of the standards that apply to it, without knowing all of the fabrication and assembly steps that might be necessary, without knowing the scope of the problem. How many of these units are even necessary? How am I gonna manufacture it? What like FDA clearances, et cetera, are required? And so the original goal of the group, which started off at like 58 people on the first day was, hey, Let's just figure out how to, how to put guardrails on this problem. How do we define what engineering problem we're supposed to be solving, right? And in this very specific vein of ventilators. And then I went and asked one of my uh, professional acquaintances, one of my mentors, like, hey, what do, what, what's going on? Like, how can, how can ventilators help? Um, and the first thing that she said was, forget the ventilators. If we run out of ICU physicians, it doesn't matter how many ventilators there are in the world. You can't intubate someone without an ICU physician who's been training for this for years. And if the ICU physician doesn't have PPE, they are going to get sick and they won't be able to intubate anyone and they won't be able to use your fancy little ventilator. And so she immediately restructured my entire concept of this, right? to start considering things that were not ventilators. Like the problem is probably a lot bigger than I think it is. The next day I called a practicing ICU physician in New York and I was like, look, what, what do you actually need, right? Like I've, I've been told ventilators are not the thing. What do you actually need? And the, <laughs> the response was, we need PPE, quite simply. That's what we need right now. If I had a top three, you know, list, it would be PPE, PPE, PPE. Just give me PPE, right? And so that triggered this drastic restructuring, right? Of like, okay, I was wrong. It's not ventilators, it's everything. And we need to rethink our entire approach. And that is where open source COVID-19 medical supplies really began. Right, that's, that's the structure um, that got put in place. And that meant that now we have to think about the entire holistic problem. We need to think about what the disease is, how it's treated, what supplies are used to treat it, what standards apply to literally, literally every supply that is used to treat this thing, what the open source answer is to all of these supplies instead of just ventilators, Right, and all of these different elements that are way bigger than designing any one project. Um, and that turned into this medical supply guide. So we took the requirements document that used to be focused entirely on ventilators. We copied and pasted like 40 different times. We renamed each copy and paste something new like gloves, like uh, face masks, like face shields. Right, and we started creating this much, much larger document that we called the medical supply guide um, so that we could give makers around the world and manufacturers around the world a very simple, lame and accessible introduction to the challenges around COVID-19. Like why this is an issue, what supplies are needed, 
how they need to be made so that people understood that the scope of the problem is huge, right? It's not just about ventilators, right? Those might not even be helpful to make. We might have enough based on how we're, we're actually, you know, combating this disease now. Um, so this started immediately, like afterwards, six, seven days ago, you know, a week after the group formed. And then the first US shelter in place was called. So just to give people a timeline, this all happened before like we realized in the US that there was a huge issue, right? Because that's how quickly we had to move to get ahead of it. Um, and this is what this has looked like since then. We had this gigantic growth in the group once we opened up, you know, and realized that the problem was much bigger than medical supply or much bigger than ventilators. And we realized that the problem was global, right? We went from zero to 73,000 members of the group in, you know, about a month, right? Um, and that's, that's crazy. <laughs> like that's, that's out of this world. That is like, you know, one of the fastest, you know, groupings of makers that I have ever seen in my entire life. Um, similarly, we have a Slack channel that is not the um, Facebook group itself, that is essentially a flash NGO. And that grew at a similar pace around a similar timeline. Um, this is when people were joining, then we were figuring out how are we all working together? How are we pulling this together? And this is on the Slack channel, which has 830 some members now, but in terms of daily active, uh, active users, um, you know, is, is relatively small. And so this Flash NGO is like, we picked people very deliberately out of the Facebook group and out of our friends networks that we could bring in for professional advice because one expert cuts through, one expert opinion cuts through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of non-expert opinions, right? And so we brought in doctors, epidemiologists, nurses, other medical professionals as quickly as possible to start getting ties to the medical community, understanding you know, the problem at hand. We brought in um, transcriptionists, librarians, researchers, and scientists to like start working on the medical supplies guide because it went from like, you know, a five or six page ventilator requirements document to a probably now 150 to 200 page medical supply guide fully fleshed out with links to most standard agencies that we can find. Uh, we brought in communications and marketing specialists because, again, this information is useless if it's not getting out into the world. We brought in a team of community managers and moderators because it turns out having 74,000 people in a single forum gets rockets. Right? It, gets, it gets useless quickly uh, if you can't cut through the noise. We brought in designers, engineers of all types to, to look at designs, determine if they're manufacturable, determine what can be done um, on that kind of side. We brought in makers and fabricators of all types from all scales, ranging from somebody in the garage all the way up to you know, somebody with an injection mold and dye shop. Um, we brought in uh, community organizers, um, bringing their communities together, bringing their manufacturers, their makers, you know, into a cohesive network to support their local community. We brought in translators from all over the world. We have over, you know, 400 working on translating the documents into 70 different languages. Um, and, you know, there are, there are a ton of like CEOs, there are a ton of CEOs, there are a ton of other folks who are also involved in this kind of flash NGO. Um, and then 55 days ago, we realized that we are running the risk of burning a whole bunch of people out because this is entirely volunteer and people were putting in eight hours a day while trying to hold down a job. And so we, we came to an agreement and we partnered with Resolve and we got funded by Schmidt Futures, by Toyota Research Institute, by private donors uh, so that we could stand up a full-time team so we didn't burn people out. Um, and then we have been just like awestruck by how makers have responded. So, Makers have took our documentation, they've come up with their own things, they've talked about new designs in the forum, right? And they have just been cranking all over the world. Um, this is just a couple of tiny snapshots of people coming up with new types of, uh, you know, 
CPAP and BiPAP ventilation helmets, new types of cloth mask designs, new types of face shields, uh, decontamination devices, people all over the world coming together to make these suggestions. We have you know, the Manila Sewing Club uh, being sent isolation gowns by their vice president in the Philippines so that they can deconstruct them from scratch and scan them and turn them into open source plans, right? We have, you know, everyone making things from, you know, maker spaces. Uh, we have individuals cranking things out. We have, you know, people, the entire family is getting together with their sewing machines and making cloth masks. You know, everyone is stepping up all over the world in this amazing fashion, right? Um, we have YouTube influencers. We have Destin from Smarter Every Day spooling up an entire local manufacturing system, including injection molders, including hospitals, right? Like taking care of all of these folks, all of these cities, you know, in his area, right? We have people translating into so many different languages all of our documents so that, you know, their countries can get access to this information and they can spool up internal efforts similar to OSMS, right, all over the world to supply what they need. Um, and that's a really big deal, right? Like that is huge. We are, we are getting the information out there. We are getting people to support their local communities and we are building these resilient networks globally as a group, right? Like OSMS is, is the platform, it is the communication. Um, it is not, you know, making anything itself. It is enabling all of you makers to do this work. Um, so, you know, what's next? We started seeing production drops in makers across the world. We started asking why. We started seeing people say, hey, I'm making fewer things because demand has dropped. Like the people that I talked to who needed things have gotten what they need. And I don't know who to talk to anymore. And at the same token, we as OSMS know that hospitals are still hurting, right? 40% of physicians' assistants, as of a survey released three days ago, were reporting that they didn't have PPE when they were treating COVID-19 positive patients, right? 40% of current physicians' assistants were saying they don't have PPE, right? We have people in the maker community saying, I'm making fewer supplies because I've run out of money. I've run out of resources. I've run out of plastic, right? And we're taking this to heart, right? We're seeing this response and we're trying to figure out are there ways we can help people set these resilient networks and structures up. Um, so, you know, the efforts that we're, we're looking at now, we are trying very hard to continue building coalitions. Again, there is so much work to be done. We can't do it on our own. None of you can do it on your own. Right? We all have to work together. Right? We have to build these coalitions. We have to keep sharing information because there's, there's no other option. Right? We have to better connect groups that are responding all over the world with their communities. Right? We have to help as best we can to help folks you know, talk to the hospital that still needs supplies, talk to the homeless shelter that hasn't received any supplies, talk to the grocery store that still has workers that don't have masks because the masks don't exist. Right? Because again, 3M can make 100 million on 95s a month, but we need three and a half billion just to get to what's necessary, right? Just in the US. We wanna connect our local response groups to resources. We wanna connect local response groups um, and help them create formal operations and sustainable efforts, right? Because none of this happens um, over the long haul unless you start planning for the long haul, right? You will just burn yourselves out. You will run out of money. You will become surprised, right? And you will have to stop. And if you want to keep doing this for the duration of the pandemic, or if you feel like you have to, right? There's a lot of lessons that we all have to collectively learn to figure out how to do that. Um, what networks can we create to be mutually supportive? And we have to start thinking about, you know, more broadly, how do we respond to the effects of the pandemic beyond the medical effects, right? How do we go beyond this um, and talk about, you know, hey, do we need to address food shortages? Hey, do we need to address, you know, other types of issues that are going to crop up from the fact that a lot of our societies have shut down, right? And a lot of businesses have gone under. 
that we may need, right? Uh, that's a big scary thing, but as makers connected to your local communities, once again, you will be the ones who can act fastest. You will be the ones who can address these problems. And you have already built inroads into your communities and created these networks that allow for you to respond to these scary situations. And so, you know, how do we help? How do we encourage that? Um, I think that's that's all I want to say. I want to leave a lot of time for questions and conversation, um, but but that's where I wanted to start, and that is open source medical supplies. Um, I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to look at all of the chats that have come in. Um, let's see. So I saw a Q and A bubble. Two Q and A. Uh, what documentation system do you use? for standard operating procedures in your manufacturing documents. Um, so we are in the process of, uh, this is Nick Cap. So we are in the process of uh, essentially creating a new effort around technical documentation. So uh, one of the big things for us is that uh, a lot of the documentation we link to may be incomplete. It may be a YouTube video, it may be, you know, a um, JPEG, it, like all the, the documentation spans the spectrum of things that are, you know, able to be understood. And the issue is that if we're trying to get to every language on earth, right, there are some forms of documentation that are helpful for that, and there are some forms of documentation that are hurtful for that. So what OSMS has been doing as part of our technical documentation effort is we've been ingesting a lot of these different types of documentation, and we've been repackaging them into easy to digest guides on how to make things that are also easy to translate and localize. Um, so we're just now really digging into like, how do we take these open source designs that have been so helpful and get them into a position where anybody from average garage maker to mid to large size, you know, automation and, and like machine shop can take these designs and run with them. Uh, because the only way that we think a lot of these problems get solved is if we transition from makers making things to traditional manufacturing making things, but traditional manufacturing needs pretty specifically formatted instructions. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. Um, the documentation system is one that we've rolled up ourselves. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about that soon. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I'm going to bring on Colin Keogh to ask you a question. He's asked several in here, so we can bring him yeah. on as a panelist. Uh, he should show up. Uh, and uh, uh, Colin is with, uh, there we are. Hello. Hi, Colin. <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. <laughs> Colin, well, introduce that was yourself. Excellent talk. Thank you. Sorry, Dale. Go ahead. No, just introduce yourself, if you would. So my name is Colin Keogh. I'm an engineer from Ireland. Um, I joined the um, Puigis group when it was still the ventilator project, and we had a fork off into open source ventilators in Ireland. So we've been developing ventilators and additional projects over the last, uh, however long it is, two months. It feels like 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> two months. So I just have a question for you again, Guy, as well. So good, well done. The network is excellent. We're evolving as our group as the need kind of reduce for some of the specific designs. Is there a, how would you recommend external groups like ours best present some of our developed content to the OSMS network? So there's two, there's two ways, right? Um, so the one is the interaction with the group and the second is the interaction with the guide, right? So in terms of the guide, like the best process that's worked for us is if you have a single link to a whole project, right? So take your ventilator, right? There's a single link, that link includes documentation packages, assembly instructions, relevant standards, right? Like fabrication instructions, everything packaged into a single link. We've seen people do it on GitHub. We've seen people roll their own website, right? We've seen people put things like legal disclaimers before you can access the information saying like, hey, you need to sign this license or whatever before you get access to that. All of that is great, right? But like collapsing it into a single link, setting it, sending it to our um, info at opensourcemedicalsupplies.org email address, 
Um, right now, so we've had a bit of a switch as a group. Um, in, when we were in dire crisis mode five or six weeks ago, we were having volunteer doctors and clinicians and physicians looking at designs and giving us feedback on the fly. And since then, we've seen this amazing shift where entire hospital systems and the NIH and the FDA and the EU equivalents have started approving open source designs on the fly. And that's the only sustainable path that we can see to that kind of liability. So if you have that single link and if it has been reviewed by a governing body, a hospital system or another institution that can carry that liability, then send that to us and tell us up front, hey, this has been reviewed by the following institutions who have signed off on it. Give us that blurb, right? And then we can put it in the guide, right? And that's, that's our big gateway is that we can't take that liability on ourselves because we have no way to test. We have no way to like ensure that these things are safe, right? But that is the inclusion in the guide. And then once you do that step, we, you are totally welcome to throw that link into the larger group and say, hey, we've had this design, it's gone through its process, right? And now we're at the point where we have this, you know, like package you can download, right? Or package you can do. Um, and we'll amplify that in the group as best we can. That is, that is always the social media game of like, when was it posted? How many people are online? How many people are paying attention, right? So in the, in the very short term blip kind of way, we can elevate on Facebook in the, you know, waterfall of posts that are going by daily, right? But in the long-term way, inclusion into our guide means that we actually do categorize that into um, a longer-term repository that sticks around for as long as we can manage it. Sounds great. Okay. Expect a big data pack from us soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So nice. any, any advice for local OMS groups to trying to connect with their state government to look at N95 PAPR stopgap equivalents made by local makers. They're yeah. Difficult to push to hospitals compared to face shields and hand-sewn masks. Yep. Um, so the most successful models that we've seen are makers that team up with progressive hospital systems. So in Durango, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, um, Vancouver, uh, Boston and Maryland, we have seen um, maker spaces that have made direct ties to their hospitals. And those maker spaces have been in iterative loops with their hospitals. So the maker spaces will submit a design to the hospital. Usually it's like level four, or level five hospitals. Um, those hospitals will actually test with live bites, right? And then those hospitals have the ability to say, hey, there is, you know, this device worked, it filtered the thing, it, it performed as expected, and we like it, right? And then hospitals are the ones with the sway to convince state governments, right? Because state governments have no way to validate on their own, and they're terrified of inheriting that liability, right? But a hospital's coming forward and saying, no, we need this, right? Particularly if, if you come to them and say, hey, this group in Seattle did this thing this group in Durango did this thing, right? There's, there's um, a lot of local precedents being set there that aren't, you know, under any circumstances normal, right? But this is a pandemic. So, you know, things, things that we've noticed have worked, you know, people taking supplies to like unions, right? Like taking medical supplies and PPE to nursing unions and saying, hey, this isn't perfect, but it works, right? People coordinating with level four and level five hospital systems to do testing. People coordinating with research doctors who are writing papers, right? And who can write a paper saying, hey, this is effective. It's in the medical literature now, here's the reference, right? Like those are strategies that we've seen, but it's really, it's really weird, really hard and really backwards for how this whole system is supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, Guy, here, here's a uh, go. What elements of this challenge remain the most chaotic? <laughs> it's like, how do you choose, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, the hardest part is the kind of constant redefinition of what it is that we're doing and how it is that we're doing it, because you know it's been ten weeks, right? And like ten weeks ago, like federal guidance was that you couldn't catch COVID nineteen unless you came into contact with an international traveler, 
right? <laughs> like, you know, 10 weeks ago, the idea of an open source medical supply of any shape, of any variety was unheard of, right? <laughs> like, like the challenge here is that the situation on the ground, the situation from top down, all of it continues to change all the time. And you have to continuously update your models and your understandings of the situation. You know, you, you brought up at the beginning that you worked on systems. And, and I think one of the big lessons here is that a lot of our systems aren't built to deal with this kind of change. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, and in some ways, I think really one of the opportunities here is, is to create organizations that are more uh, responsive to change. Uh, uh, and, and that's a hard problem. I mean, I don't know that we know what that is, but the flash NGO is, is kind of an idea here is how do you put something up uh, quickly and focus it and change it all the time? Yeah, and I, I mean, the, the hardest part that I've seen is, you know, there are, there are existing organizations that do this kind of work, but a certain, like an organization of an existing size and of an existing history has a lot of institutional barriers to action, right? You have to get buy-in from a large number of people in order to move quickly on a thing. And we've seen, you know, organizations that are crisis response organizations or are, you know, international development organizations not respond in time if only just because of the inertia of how large organizations work. And so it's this very strange requirement for like, a lot of high like value input from a lot of people like a lot of consensus building needs to happen um but at the same time it has to happen astonishingly quickly and that means leaving traditional hierarchies at the door leaving traditional power structures at the door leave, leaving ego at the door for all of these people because you can't actually build consensus if someone's thinking like my way is the only way. Um, and, and that's incredibly hard to overcome in the best of times. And this is, a, this is a crisis, right? So it's just like, it's a very hard problem to solve just in general organizationally. Yeah. Well, let's, let's leave it at that. I think we're up against our, our time limit here, but uh, you know, I wanna thank you for participating it was really great to see and I, I you know it just struck me the 75 days you know look what it, all that has happened in 75 days and and in 90 days earlier we didn't know any of this would happen right so um it's it's pretty amazing uh thank you for all the work that you and your team judan um sabrina and everybody else uh, uh, uh molly um you know keep keep good notes because i think we have to almost look back and think about what what <laughs> what really happened here, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And uh, thank you for all the attendees. Um, this will be archived and uh, I hope you share it with others and get the word out. Um, thank you again, Guy. Yeah. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, it's great to you know, virtually say hi. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>